So now that we understand the various opportunities along the mineral value chain, and also some bits of the constraints that impede us from taking full advantage of the opportunities the value chain present to us to drive industrialization and also drive diversification of our economies to move away from an enclave extractive sector to a broad-based economy. What actions are required for capacity development or what actions are required to ensure that we can push for diversification of our economy and also drive industrialization through the mineral resource sector. The chart here, it seems cumbersome, but if you pay attention very well, the middle here is the mining operation. All these things tells us the various linkages, downstream, upstream, and side linkages that can help propel a well-diversified economy and drive industrialization. So over here, at each stage or at each uh, linkage, you realize there is employment. So if we really want to make meaningful gains from our mineral resources beyond the fiscal, because the point is that the mining sector in itself can barely employ much. The mining sector in itself employs only a few people and even within the procurement uh, supply and supply chain, only some limited um, suppliers or some limited entrepreneurs can be key players along the supply chain. Where we can really make maximum benefits or gains from the mining sector are uh, through the various linkages because each linkage will create its own set of employment. Each linkage will create its own of procurement and supply chain. Each linkage will create its own um, opportunities for tax revenues so that government tax uh, revenue accruals from the mineral sector will not only be limited to what is paid by contractors, subcontractors, and, and, and other service providers, or employees' um, income taxes, or just the corporate income taxes from the mining companies. But now, the opportunity to harness tax revenue is broadened beyond the mining operation to other sectors of the economy by virtue of the various inputs that they are supplying the mining sector, by virtue of the processing of mineral oils and value addition, this creates a booming manufacturing sector. And it is through this that we can drive an industrialization agenda. When you look to your right, you see infrastructure, provision R&D and skills, that's um, investing in research and development because it's through research and development that you'll be able to produce such skills of high competence that one can feed into the mining sector to be able to undertake core occupation within the mining sector and also come up with innovation and advanced technology that will be of use to the sector instead of importing such technologies. Also have financial services because all of these operations, your financial institutions will have the opportunity to provide them credit. And also the financial services will also be avenue for deposit and also um, performing other financial uh, technical services to these companies. We have the communication sector. So these are side, side, side linkages. So there are enormous opportunities, as you can see from this pictorial diagram, 
That's why it looks so much because at each level, there is something to harness from. You realize that the middle year, which is the mining operation, rather looks clearer. There's not much. That's the direct benefits that we can make from the extractive sector. It's not so much. So you have the mining operation, you have your the supply chains here, and you have um, maybe a bit of value addition here through um, various forms of um, processing that we spoke about at uh, model one. You have it here. And that's it, that's directly, that's so much that just so much we can make from the extractive sector. The main gains are those outside here, outside the portions colored um, gray. You realize there are so much um, activities going on here that if specific focus are given to outside the mining operations, our government can have so much, our other sectors, the manufacturing sector, the financial services, communications, the service sector, all can begin to um, um, be vibrant because of the presence of mining operations in the country. But many times the focus is here, which give us just a little, because at the end of the day, the final uh, product, usually just the ore itself, which is um, just processed a little, exported. Once exported, one thing we should bear in mind is that most times these mining companies, especially the large scale mining companies, are not domiciled in our economies. They are not um, indigenous. So the monies, whatever proceeds that are made from uh, the export proceeds are repatriated back to their mother companies elsewhere in the West. So at the end of the day, we can boast of those macroeconomic indicators. We can boast of um, export proceeds. We can boast of the extractive sector contributing significantly to our exports, contributing significantly to our trade balance. But the bottom line is we still have depreciating currencies. Why? Because the monies that were made from our exports never stayed in the country to support the strength of our currency and also support other economic activities. So what are the opportunities and requirements? One opportunity is local use of raw materials. The picture that I showed earlier indicates that if all these things are sourced locally as part of um, the development and production of mineral resources, then it means that significant portion of the expenditure in the pie chart I shared in the earlier slide will stay within the country. That has been its um, employment, that is raw materials, it could be human resource, or it could be other um, physical inputs. If these raw materials are sourced locally, that will mean that significant portion of the expenditure in the green area will be retained because we have um, the service providers or the human resource in the country. So the money will not be exported, but will be retained. Key opportunity, as I mentioned in the previous slide, is, and, and, uh, is, is maximizing the various linkages around the mining operations and not just focusing on the direct benefits from the mining itself, but the opportunities around it, the opportunity to develop your human resource, the opportunity to invest in R&D, to, 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 to be able to come up with technology, advanced technologies and innovations to support the sector, opportunities to be able to uh, produce your own inputs to supply the sector, opportunities to process the mineral oil and add some value to it so that it will have a higher value at the international market. 
So how do we do this? What a country needs to do is not just focus on the middle, but to come up with a coherent strategy, a strategy that will look at the various opportunities surrounding the mining sector that the country can make use of, which can drive industrialization, which can cause a, a more diversified economy. Because as we saw in the earlier slide, even the financial institutions are not left out. Research, communication, it's like all other sectors of the economy have one way or the other can benefit from the mining operations if proper strategies or an effective approach is adopted to be able to optimize those opportunities hanging around the mining operations. And one may mention, how do we get this? It's not about the communication sector coming up with its own strategy to see how it can take advantage of the opportunity presented by the presence of the mine or the um, um, uh, manufacturing sector coming up with its strategy. But this calls for concerted efforts among the various sectors to have a well harmonized strategy because just the financial um, sector cannot, because they are not directly linked to the mine sector. And if you pick communications, yes, some form of communicate, adopt, um, adopt, um, use of communication services, but this one, what we are talking about here is not just the use of communication, but, but and, uh, uh, the whole communication sector being properly integrated within the value chain of the mine. So it's, it's, it's about a concerted effort from the various stakeholders and perhaps multi-stakeholder, uh, multi-sectorial um, um, setup to come up with the requisite strategy to see where each sector, the role that each sector can play to come up with the requisite um, strategy, to come up with the policy action that will integrate the human resource, that will integrate research and development, that will integrate which one goes first and how do we um, um, integrate the various sectors in order to ensure that the other economic sectors that are not directly linked to the mine are also benefiting. In the development of such a strategy, it is important to consider the level of infrastructure capacity of the country. How much can you produce if you want to be the supplier of inputs? How much can you produce? What's the level of your human resource? Because all these are necessary so that in case you do not have the requisite infrastructure or the requisite capacity currently, to produce or supply such inputs, or even your human resource is not ready to, to, to participate in the various uh, stages in the value chain, the strategy should be able to capture this so that the implementation will be progressive. Otherwise, if you just come up with a comprehensive strategy without taking cognizance of the gaps, the infrastructure gaps, the human resource gaps, and all that, you realize that it will be difficult to implement such a strategy, no matter how comprehensive it is. So I've already mentioned the export of unprocessed or unrefined um, mineral uh, resources that are extracted from African economies. And this means that once you do not process it here, all the benefits, the downstream opportunities that was shown in the other slide is going into the export destination. The country where the goods or where the mineral ores are being exported to, they will rather benefit or they will rather be able to make use of the opportunities, the downstream opportunities that the mining sector 
um, present because you've already forgone any benefit you could have made from value addition. Similarly, I've already talked about this, the issue of uh, provision of inputs. What are the types of inputs that are required to supply the mineral sector to ensure that investor operations run smoothly if really we want to optimize the gains from extractive resources? I mentioned the capacity of the country to produce the input. If the capacity is not the what steps, what strategic steps are being undertaken to ensure that in years to come, maybe in the next two years, in the next five years, or in the next decade, we want to be here. We want to be able to be the key or primary supplier of mineral input or um, um, mining input. We want to be the primary supplier or service providers of key and technical um, support services that are required by the industry. So the challenges and current gaps, I've already highlighted some of them, but just a way, as a way of going through the presentation, the key challenge that inhibits us from taking advantage of these sectoral linkages is the lack of human capacity and educational skills. Many times we are not proactive in our steps. We are not proactive in our measures. Many times we wait for the discovery, we wait for production, we wait until it is way too late before we begin to uh, shift emphasis or focus uh, to how we can harness some of these gains. For instance, in Ghana, even though Ghana had been exploring for uh, petroleum for decades, it, it never took um, uh, measurable actions or it never took proactive measures to educate its human resources or build the capacity of its human resources and equip them with the requisite skills to make them employable in the uh, petroleum sector. So that in the event of a commercial discovery, we will have existing human capacity and that also possess the technical skills and competency to be employed in the sector. Although we were busily um, 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 signing and ratifying petroleum agreements, we never took this step until there was a commercial discovery in 2007. Then suddenly it dawned on us that we don't even have the human resource to fill in the employment gap. So now we have a lot of um, um, expatriates coming in to support the development and production of our hydrocarbons. Whereas we have a lot of um, unemployed graduates, which the government could have taken advantage of to reduce the unemployment rate. So it was while this is going on when we already have foreigners taking over the development of hydrocarbons, that funds were, were set aside to sponsor the education and the capacity development of interested um, um, graduates where we have to now sponsor um, and grant scholarships to people abroad to go and learn the technical skills and all that that are required. So now we developed a local content policy, but the point is that some portions of it are difficult to implement because there is a skills gap. Even if petroleum or oil companies want to employ the available labor force do not possess the requisite skills. We barely even had educational institutions that offer courses 
related to uh, petroleum and all that. So some, some of um, these actions that do not help some of um, our attitudes by government and all the cities and stakeholders alike, that we are not able to take pro pragmatic measures to foresee and bridge some of these gaps, inhibit us from taking full advantage of such technical um, sectors. So we have scarce educational facilities, like I mentioned, whilst the development and production of I had started, our educational institutions were not even offering courses in 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 in, in um, petroleum related um, 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 focus, but now we have so much of them. Weak vocational and technical training, lack of educational accreditation, growing demand for highly skilled workers in the industry. Meanwhile, the highly skilled workers do not exist. So have poor infrastructure. For a typical, um, for a sector like the mining, mining sector, roads and other physical infrastructure are very critical because they use the, the transportation of the mineral from the mine site to the ports and even to processing plants through to the ports and all that can be very cumbersome. But as you can see, our similar characteristics in terms of road infrastructure, rail infrastructure, um, are woefully inadequate. Many times is um, these mining companies, after they have settled, they have to even create access routes to the communities within which they operate to the mines and all that. All this inhibits the provision of the relevant um, 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 materials and input. And it also decreases our profitability and level of competitiveness. Because if the company is supposed to do all this by themselves, it means that their cost of production goes up. And by cost of production going up, meaning that um, um, taxable revenues, the revenue that could be taxed will also will reduce. So in order to maximize um, these opportunities, there is the need for government and stakeholders alike to focus on the legal, the institutional and regulatory framework for both the private sector, um, that's um, multinational companies that come in to invest as well as private sector within the local context, that's indigenous um, companies. We have to equip them such that they'll be able to effectively participate in the sector. What is government doing to reduce their cost of doing business? Because for the multinationals, excessive tax exemptions are granted them um, to help facilitate the importation of um, various um, inputs and equipment and all that to support the development of mineral production. What is government doing to support local businesses to create that enabling environment to make them competitive, create that enabling environment to create to, to, to make it conducive to pushing them to effectively participate within the mineral value chain? Other challenges also include weak industrial base. Before I started, I was talking about um, how opponents of energy transition um, say that the West have used hydrocarbons to develop or to industrialize, and now they want us to abandon our resources. But the question one may ask is, at the time that they were driving industrialization with um, fossil fuel, where was Africa? because some African countries have been producing fossil fuels for decades. How come we've not been able to industrialize with fossil fuels, but Western countries have been able to do so. And now we stay back and say that they have industrialized and we are yet to take advantage of hydrocarbons. 
So the problem is that generally there is a weak industrial base. Our level of industrialization is very low, although we have the requisite resources to do so, but we do not have the, 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 the required institutional framework, regulatory framework, a world governance structure in order to push this agenda. We may have the laws, we may have um, um, the policies, but we also have implementation problems. It's been 10 years since um, the Africa mining vision. It's been over 10 years. And yet here we are, how many countries have been able to fully contextualize the Africa mining vision to drive industrialization using mineral resources. So local supply capacity, we have to assess local supply capacity we have developed long-term plans because we cannot just come up with a strategy and want to industrialize or diversify our economic base. Why? Because we do not have the capacity, both in human resource and infrastructure. So any plan, any strategy must be a long-term so that such actions to drive industrialization and diversification will be progressive. We've already talked about the skills the tax regime and all that. Poor governance and inadequate economic environment. I mentioned earlier that what kind of um, conducive or enabling environment do we create for our private sector? Private sector, in this, I'm talking about our indigenous companies or indigenous enterprises who are willing or at least have some basic requisite skills to participate along the mining value chain. How is government supporting them or how is our regulatory framework being crafted in such a manner that cushions the little they are able to do, be able to develop their capacity so that in years to come, they will be giants, not only serving the local contest, but even be able to export some of their final products out of the country or out of the continent. They need for a transparent political and macroeconomic stability. Unfortunately, in most resource and DAO countries, there are high incidence of conflict, issue, um, 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 conflicts between youth and even the extractive companies, agitations among local communities because they feel marginalized or because they feel cheated, they feel they are bearing the direct brunt of mining activity and yet their community remains impoverished because they feel that despite being hopeful that the presence of mining, um, mining activity will bring them prosperity, their lives are now impoverished and they are now even deprived prior to, um, um, to the advent of mining operations. We need to access long-term financing. What are the, the, the system in place to ensure that access to finance in order to be able to participate or create your own enterprise and be a player within the value chain is, is secured. Currently, cost of doing uh, cost of credit is so high, whilst foreign companies are able to access um, credit at a relatively lower cost. This makes the our indigenous indigenous companies um, less competitive. We should also find ways to take advantage of international trade agreements to be able to support our um, indigenous companies to operate both locally and also internationally. So that's one of the key uh, objectives of local content policies, not just to deepen the participation of local companies, but also to develop their competencies through knowledge transfer, through capacity development, through skills transfer, and be able to um, produce or provide service at a more competitive um, level 
and also to be able to come out with skill uh, skill services or final or input or physical product at an international competitive level so that they'll be able to compete at the international scene even beyond the mine operation in the local context. So what are some of the strategies that can be taken? One, there is the general acknowledgement that the resources are limited because they are non-renewable and can be depleted. However, they have environmental footprint that after my closure, sometimes it's nearly impossible to reclaim the mine area, especially for agricultural purposes or for human settlement. It's, it's nearly impossible. Therefore, there's the need to make the use out, uh, to make the most out of these uh, mining operations in a manner that will promote local content, in the manner that will drive industrialization, so that at the end of the day, there will be available funds to at least um, ensure that environmental footprint or environmental impact are, are mitigated after mine closure to the barest minimum or in a manner that do not um, pose danger to nearby communities and the ecosystem. I mentioned local content policy, so we need an industrial policy that will integrate our local economy and how to drive the industrialization agenda using our local businesses. The policy has to be sustainable that ensure that our local um, our local businesses are competitive. The policy should also be able to stimulate employment and entrepreneurship. There should be opportunity, it should be, like I mentioned earlier, the, the focus of the policy should not just be centered in the middle, that's the mine operation, the direct benefits of the mine operation, but look broadly at the indirect benefits, that's the value addition, diversification, technology transfer, knowledge creation, uh, understanding of the sector's value chain, and review of challenges and impacts. Thus, the policy should not just be there, but at every point in time, should be able to review the current um, operations and identify the gaps and be able to come up with specific measures to close that gap, such that at the end of the day, the end goal will be achieved. So that brings us to local content. I've already spoken at length about local content because by achieving um, um, diversification and industrialization in Uga, the, the center of it all is our local content. That's the purchase of goods and services, local employment, benefits of mining in other sectors of the economy, local. So everything should be local. We should. Again, the other linkages should be locally centered, thus such that mine operations will locally source their goods and services because they are available, the local, there is local capacity to fully meet the demand of mine operations. In terms of employment, human resource has the requisite capacity to fill in the employment gap and there'll be no need to import expatriates to take, to, to take over the management of the mine, but our human resource ha will have the capacity to do so. To make sure that the benefits of the mine is not just for the few elites who have the relevant competencies to participate in the mine, either as um, an, a dir uh, through direct employment or along the procurement and supply chain, but also to extend the gains to other sectors of the economy in order to open up the sector to ensure that the benefits trickle down to other economic sectors, like we mentioned the manufacturing sec uh, um, sector, the financial service sector, the um, R&D, 
um, um, communication sector, etc. Local processes, we should not be exporting, we should create policies that will ensure that there is local processing of mineral res uh, mineral ores that are extracted from our grounds, the value addition and beneficiation so that our the gains that we could make through employment whilst uh, locally processing um, the mineral resources, the gains in terms of taxes, the gains in terms of um, production of input, the gains in terms of um, 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 government um, tax revenues will stay in the economy. Boris spoke about increased local capacity of participants as um, producers in the value chain, entrepreneurs and all that. One thing that we should acknowledge is that, although despite our similarities as a continent, each country has its own um, challenges. Even though the challenges are similar, it may vary in terms of grades, it may vary in terms of um, quantum. Therefore, there is no need to uh, import a certain country's policy and, and, and adopt it in wholesale simply because it is working over there. It is always important to consider your, your, your country's specific challenge, your country's specific gaps, your country's specific um, 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 uh, capabilities to inform the establishment of such policies, to inform the establishment of such strategic reforms. And lastly, to create local content, there's the need to understand the National Development Plan and the role of the mining industry. Usually, um, countries usually have National Development Plan. When we come together, we have National Development Plan, which is done um, every, I think every three years or four years. And usually when you look at the National Development Plan, we have the role of the extractive sector well enshrined in the plan. How governments intend to use the extractive sector to propel development. So the local content should also look at this national development and see the direction of the country. We should be able to take stock of the current situation. By way of summary, I've already mentioned it. That's the opportunities the skills, use and service and infrastructure that are needed. There should be proper assessment of the mining value chain to be able to see in detail the kind of skills that are required to understand the goods and services, what goes into the production of those goods and what kind of skills uh, are required in order to be able to provide the services required. What kind of infrastructure physical infrastructure are needed to be able to take advantage or to be able to localize the mining value chain. What targets are possible? Like I said, depending on your level of capacity in terms of skills, in terms of um, infrastructure, in terms of the production of goods and provision of services, that should inform the targets you make. So your local content policy will not just be um, um, requiring foreign companies employ this employ this number um, 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 secure these goods and services locally and all that. The point is the targets that you are setting, you have the capacity to meet them. Is it possible that if really mining companies want to source skills locally, do you do your human resource possess the requisite skills? to be able to submit the demand from mining companies. That's why it is always necessary to do it progressively over um, some um, um, agreed period of time. What gaps need to be filled? It is important to identify the skills gap, it's um, important to identify the capacity gap, even from your local entrepreneurs and come up with initiatives 
that will help to bridge that gap. You may have the human resource that have a bit of knowledge in the sector or entrepreneurs that are able to supply some basic inputs or some basic services. But the point is you want to be able to have as much as you can within the value chain. That is why it is important to assess the gap, even for those who are already participating in the value chain. What is their gap? How do you move them from um, point A to point B? And how do you also prepare those who are yet to enter from point zero to point uh, two or point three? What leverage could government have on investors? What do you have to be able to have a proper negotiation or proper agreement between the government and investors to ensure that they comply with the local content policy? What assurances can we give investors that with the implementation of um, that local content, you not um, um, with the participate uh, with the application of that local content, investors will really get what they want. Like I mentioned, you don't have to import, um, you don't have to import um, 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 a local content policy from someone else's country because it is working. It should be context specific. What is feasible, what is possible under your uh, current circumstances. But one may ask, if we want to ensure proper linkages and diversification and drive industrialization, is local content sufficient? Is it the right tool um, to drive this? That's especially if after an in-depth assessment, it reveals that um, capacity the level of capacity is way below what is required or uh, monitoring of, uh, or, or effective monitoring to ensure proper implementation of the policy is weak or the cost involved in participating the in the value um, participating or taking advantage of the value chain is 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 so high that it does not justify local supply of inputs because maybe after local uh, locally producing those inputs still imported inputs may be cheaper will it still make sense to source those goods locally because the investor is profit driven if imported inputs are cheaper and uh, locally made inputs are expensive the investor is more driven to go for the foreign made one Therefore, it is important to focus on the short term. Like I mentioned, it should be progressive. So you cannot do a wholesale implementation of the local content uh, policy. You should look at in the interim, what can be done? Which of these opportunities can we harness in the short term? Which of them can we harness in the long term or in the medium term? so that there will be um, appropriate steps or there will be time, to, the, the country can give itself time to be able to um, come up with the relevant um, initiatives to ensure that in the long run, these things work. So one, where linkages are poor, focuses on measures to stimulate direct employment in the sector. Job training also forms the basis for other linkages. If industrial capacity is strong, focus on strengthening local procurement. And if capacity and markets exist, explore downstream value addition. Horizontal linkages through skills and capabilities or capacities are difficult and will only occur when there are successes in local content and backward linkages. Horizontal linkages through shared infrastructure do not depend on skills and uh, capacities. All right, so that brings us to the end.
of um, this session on linkages, diversification, and industrialization through extractive um, sector or extractive resources. Thank you very much for your time. And um, as I keep on saying, feel free to share your thoughts on the session. Feel free to put on your, your to write your comment, to share your thoughts. You can also share your country experiences with us. Or uh, if you have any question, please do well to share with us and um, we will be available to respond to them. Thank you so much once again. I wish you all the best. Thank you.